at a Louisiana State University. I've got a natural resource management degree and had a lot of cool internships. Uh, one is on the endangered mad tom, which is a kind of small catfish in streams and warblers. She also went to South Africa and worked on uh, great white sharks and uh, Mozambique working on whale sharks and manta rays. Um, she got a, she came to MMES at UBI, of course, and got a strong coast internship or fellowship, but she was tired of working on sharks and rays, so she wanted to do <laughs> and She embraced parrotfish and she literally started to hug her fish. We have several oh, photos of her hugging fish. So, uh, so she's come a long way, done a lot of really fun things. Um, she's used a concrete mixer to make the receiver moorings and had lots of adventures with that. She used a grinder to cut um, rebar, a diamond bit to drill through tiles. And busted my head open. Yeah, she's, <laughs> like I said, she had a lot of adventures with these big tools, but she managed it and overcame them. Um, you'll see all these great PVC matrices. And she became an excellent surgeon at doing parrotfish, so much so that the parrotfish, her patients even smiled after surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Without any further delay, I'd like to introduce um, Jen. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you all so much for coming to my PhD. Whoops, I mean, master's <laughs> defense today, where I'll be presenting the results of my thesis research titled Assessing the effects of sediments in algal composition on the foraging and reproduction of yellowtail parrotfish, Sparasoma ruperprini. <sighs> Try saying that five times fast. But before we get into all of the technical stuff and nitty gritty details of the project, I wanna quickly zoom out and give you all a 30,000 foot view because this project is just a piece of a much larger puzzle as we take this sort of ecosystem-wide approach and we look at all of these different connections from ridge to reef. And when I say ridge to reef, what I mean is we want to make connections with what's going on on the land and how it may be impacting our nearshore marine environments. In particular, we want to look at how both human disturbances, such as coastal development and pollution, as well as natural influences like elevation, rainfall, and weather events, how they may be contributing to sediment runoff in our nearshore marine environments, how and where that sediment gets deposited, transported, and retained across the reef due to oceanographic conditions such as waves and currents, how that sediment might affect the benthic composition of the reef, particularly corals and algae, and how it might impact the foraging of herbivores like parrotfish, how sediment might, or how changes in the composition and or nutritional quality of algae might affect herbivory, and how all of these factors might influence the spawning and reproduction of these ecologically important herbivores that are critical for maintaining coral reef health and resilience. But I promise we're not talking about all of that today. As my title slide suggested, we'll primarily be focusing on sediments algal composition, and the foraging and reproduction of parrotfish across a land development gradient. So without further ado, let's get this thing officially started. <laughs> okay, so to start, parrotfish are herbivores, meaning they go hard at the salad bar. Okay, these plant eaters forage primarily in the epilithic algal matrix or EAM, which is the primary substrate or benthic covering in most reef systems that's comprised of detritus, sediments, and algal turfs. Now throughout this presentation, I'll be using the term algal turf or turf algae a lot. And what this is, it's just a multi-species assemblage or group of small unidentifiable algae. And if you're diving or snorkeling, it kind of looks like a carpet across the reef. Compare that to what we call macroalgae, which is just a broader term for larger, more identifiable algae on the reef. So like I just mentioned, there are sediments that are naturally associated with the EAM. And under these moderate sediment loads, it can actually increase the productivity and the potential yield or amount of these algal turfs to herbivores like parrotfish. However, you can have excess sediments that come into these nearshore reef systems, typically due to runoff from poor land development practices. And this tends to be exacerbated in places with 
steep elevational gradients and intense storm events like the US Virgin Islands. And when these excess sediments come into the system, it can induce what's known as a phase shift, where we see a change in the algal composition from these short productive algal turfs or spats to these long sediment laden algal turfs or LSATs, as well as macroalgae. And so again, sedimentation directly affects the benthic composition of the reef by decreasing the productivity and the nutritional quality of these short productive algal turfs. It can also decrease the foraging rates of herbivores. And it's been well documented in the literature that herbivores, especially parrotfish, tend to forage less in higher sediment areas. And it can also impact the structure of the reef by increasing coral mortality by smothering and decreasing coral recruitment. So all of these factors work synergistically to induce that phase shift that we just talked about, where we see a change from coral dominated to an algae dominated reef. Now this phase shift further affects the benthic composition by allowing for increases in macroalgae and these longer sediment laden algal turfs, which typically have reduced nutritional quality and are generally less palatable to herbivores. Now, how does all of this play into reproduction? Well, we know that reproduction is a very energetically expensive process. So in theory, any reductions in either the availability, the nutritional quality, or the palatability of these preferred food types for herbivores can ultimately lead to decreases in reproductive output and fecundity and can thus impact the overall reproductive success of some of these ecologically important species. So this is sort of a broad overview of all of these different connections from ridge to reef that we're interested in. But now getting into the methods for my particular project, my study species, like I mentioned, is the yellowtail parrotfish. They are herbivores that occupy shallow water Caribbean reefs, and they fulfill functional roles as grazers, foraging primarily on longer algal turfs and macroalgae. In particular, yellowtail parrotfish really like Dictyota, which is a brown macroalgae. Yellowtail parrotfish are also sequential hermaphrodites, specifically they're protogenous hermaphrodites, meaning they undergo sex change from female to male. And like most other species of parrotfish, they exhibit two distinct color phases based on sexual maturity. The initial phase, which is exhibited by sexually mature males and females, as well as juveniles, and the terminal phase, which is exhibited exclusively by sexually mature males that maintain and defend territories. And as you can see from these two pictures, they exhibit what's called sexual dichromatism, which is basically just a fancy way to say that their appearance, most notably their coloration, as well as their characteristics change when they undergo this transformation. But for my project, I was only interested in these initial phase fish. And that's because the initial phase forms spawning aggregations when they're ready to reproduce, whereas the terminal phase males spawn within their territories. And really what makes yellowtail parrotfish unique and makes them the perfect study species for my project is that they're considered resident group spawners. So unlike transient spawners, such as groupers and snappers, that have to migrate long distances to their spawning sites and only spawn during specific times during the year, resident spawners, such as parrotfish and wrasses, form these spawning aggregations within or near their home ranges. And these aggregations can persist for up to a few hours each day. And some species like the yellowtail parrotfish that you see in this video here have really high sex drives and they can actually spawn daily at, this, at these aggregations throughout the entire year. And lucky for me, two of these aggregations actually exist on either side of our study site in Reef Bay, St. John. So just to quickly orient you, this is a Caribbean wide view of our general study area, which encompasses Fish Bay, Reef Bay and Europa <coughs> Bay, all located on the south side of St. John here in the US Virgin Islands, which you can see pictured in the bottom map here. Now, zooming in on our general study area, we can see that Fish Bay and Western Reef Bay have a ton of coastal development, whereas Eastern Reef Bay and Europa Bay are all national parkland. So there's sort of this gradient of development and human disturbance as we move from West to East. And that'll be really important to keep in mind 
as we continue to move through this presentation. So like I just mentioned in the previous slide, there are two spawning aggregations of yellowtail parrotfish in this area, which you can see here represented by the red stars. The aggregation on the left, which throughout this presentation, I'll be calling the West FSA, was first discovered in the early 1960s. And it was the first yellowtail parrotfish aggregation that was ever documented. So we know that this particular aggregation has persisted now for over 60 years. And the aggregation on the right, the East FSA, was discovered just three years ago in 2020 by Rick Nemeth and Sean Cattison based on data from a previous study. And these two aggregations represent the primary reproductive sites for yellowtail parrotfish in this area because conditions at these sites are typically more conducive to reproductive success. Now, getting into the actual data collection methodology for my project, I designated six different sites within our general study area, three on the west and three on the east. And this is where all of our data collection took place. And if you look at this top graphic here, as we move from ridge to reef, we first monitored sediment in each of these six areas by deploying an array of ceramic tile matrices, or as I like to call them, sedimentation stations. And we deployed three of these five by three tile matrices in each site. So in total, we had 18 deployed. Then every month for one year, we randomly sampled one tile from each matrix. I then scraped all the stuff off the top of the tiles and those scrapings went through a filtration process. They were dried for three days in an oven at 65 degrees. And then they went through two consecutive burns one at 550 degrees for five hours and one in 950 degrees for six hours. And from all of that, I was actually able to calculate the amount of organic content in the sample or algae, as well as the amount of inorganic content or sediment. And the two different burns allowed me to further categorize that sediment. So I was actually able to tell how much of it came from land-based sources and how much of it was marine-based sediment. Now, moving further along our ridge to reef gradient, we also monitored and examined the benthic composition throughout our study area by conducting benthic transects. So a transect tape was attached to one of our matrices and extended out 10 meters in a randomly generated compass direction. Then every 20 centimeters, the point under the transect was identified to its lowest identifiable taxonomic level. And if the point was either algae or seagrass, the height was measured to the nearest millimeter. Now, from these data, I was able to calculate a percent cover of the different benthic types throughout our study area. And we conducted six of these transects in each of our sites every month for one year. And so in total, we collected over 16,000 data points from 432 unique benthic transects. All right, moving further from the ridge and more into the reef, we also examined the foraging ecology of initial phase yellowtail parrotfish by conducting timed fish follows. So during a 10 minute follow period, a diver would follow an initial phase yellowtail parrotfish and they would record the number of bites the fish took, what the fish was eating, the substrate type, and any other events that occurred. And from these data, I was not only able to calculate a bite rate or foraging frequency, in other words, how often these fish are actually feeding, but also bite composition, so what they were actually feeding on. And we conducted a minimum of nine fish follows in each of our sites during three different sampling periods, October and November of 2021, March and April of 2022, and August of 2022. And so in total, we conducted 169 fish follows. All right, last but not least, as it probably required the greatest amount of effort, we also monitored and examined the movements and reproductive patterns of yellowtail parrotfish throughout our entire study area by deploying an array of 55 acoustic receivers, which were mounted into these receiver bases that we built pictured here on the bottom. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with acoustic telemetry, an acoustic receiver is essentially a listening device. It's able to listen for certain sounds or frequencies 
that are emitted by tags or transmitters. And so when a tagged animal swims past the receiver, it's able to pick up and record that unique sound. And so acoustic telemetry is a really powerful way to passively track animals without having to physically be present. But it does require that you first tag the animals. So for my project, we actually tagged 60 initial phase yellowtail parrotfish, 10 from Fish Bay, 10 from Europa Bay, and 20 from either side of Reef Bay. These fish were captured during night dives, most of which lasted well past midnight. And then they were brought back to the Virgin Islands Environmental Research Station, or VIRS, where they were held in flow through seawater tables overnight. The following morning, we went back and internally tagged them with a V13 acoustic transmitter, and then we released them back to the sites that we captured them from the night before. These fish were tracked for a total of 374 days, and by the end of this project, we had over 2.5 million detections across the entire array. And from these data, I was not only able to get a general idea of their movements throughout the study area, but I was also able to calculate spawning site visitation frequency or how often these fish were actually visiting their spawning sites, as well as spawning site duration. So how long they actually spent within the vicinity of their spawning sites each day. And as you can tell from this guy, the surgery went great. And I'm really happy to report that at the official start of this project, 55 out of the 60 fish that we tagged were active within the array. So that's almost a 92% tag success rate. And now I'm about a 10th of the way to becoming a licensed MD, which is also really cool. All right, so looking at this map, you can see we monitored the shit out of this area for an entire <laughs> year, right? And really, we utilized all of these different methods and looked at all of these different variables to answer some basic research questions that I had. So number one, I wanted to know, are there differences in sediment between sides? Because we know that the West is more developed than the East, and we want to know if it's contributing to differences in sediment. Number two, are there differences in the benthic composition between sides? Number three, are there differences in the foraging rates or foraging frequency of yellowtail parrotfish by side? And are there seasonal and or site-specific differences in their foraging? And then lastly, are there differences in the reproduction of these fish by side? I know your face, Amber, I have a lot of hypotheses. <laughs> All right. So I know you've all probably just been sitting on the edge of your seats, just waiting to hear about all of the cool results I found. But before we jump into that, I want to put, it, put some things into context for you so that the results make a little more sense. So just to recap, <laughs> what do parrotfish even like? Well, less sediment and more turf algae equals a happy parrotfish. But more sediment and more brown macroalgae equals an unhappy parrotfish. So keep that in mind as we move through the results and they'll make a lot more sense. Now, I won't keep it from you any longer. Let's just dive right into it. Okay, so think back to the first question, right? Whether or not there were differences in sediment. Well, this is a plot of sediment accumulation by site. On the y-axis, we have mean sediment weight in grams and on the x-axis are all six of our sites. As we move from left to right, we go from more coastal development to less coastal development. And what we can see here is that Europa Bay, the least developed site, has significantly less sediment than all three of the Western sites. Additionally, East Outer has significantly less sediment than Fish Bay, and East Inner has significantly less sediment than both Fish Bay and West Outer. And if we look at this by side, we again see that the West has more than double the amount of sediment compared to the East. But interestingly, when we look at the proportional composition of the sediment, remember, so how much of it is land-based and how much of it is marine-based, it's not significantly different between the two sides. So a little under half of all of the sediment throughout our study area is coming from these land-based sources and the remainder is comprised of those marine-based sediments we talked about. And so the key takeaways here are that 
yeah, sediment is different. The West has significantly more sediment than the East. However, the proportional or percent composition of that sediment is not significantly different between the two sides. And about half of all of the sediment in our area is coming from these land-based sources of pollution. Now, moving on to the benthic composition. This is a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling or NMDS plot, which is plotting the differences in the benthic communities at different sites during different time periods. So if you're like me in stats class, this probably looks and sounds really confusing, right? So let me break this down for you. The points on here, like I mentioned, represent the benthic community at a specific site during a specific sampling period. So all six of our sites have 12 points because we sampled across a 12 month time period. The blue points represent the Western sites, the red points represent the Eastern sites, and the two ellipses that you see represent the 95% confidence intervals. Points that are closer to one another means that their benthic communities are more similar compared to points that are farther away. Additionally, points that are closer to these very tiny <laughs> different benthic types that you see labeled in black here means that that benthic type comprises a greater proportion of that benthic community. But if you're still looking at this and you're like, Jenna, I don't know what the heck you just said, I'm still confused, then forget everything I just said. And what I really wanna draw your attention to and focus on is brown macroalgae, turf, and CCA and encrusting algae. And that's because an NMDS is a really great way to visualize your data, but it is not a statistical test. And so to actually test for whether or not there were differences between the Eastern and Western benthic communities, I ran a similarity percentages or SIMPER analysis. And what it revealed was that brown macroalgae is contributing the most to the differences between Eastern and Western benthic communities. So if you look at this table all the way on the right, we see that 23% of the differences between the benthic communities is attributed to brown macroalgae. Turf algae contributes an additional 20% to these differences, and CCA and encrusting algae contributes an additional 17%. And so altogether, these three benthic types are responsible for over 61% of the differences between Eastern and Western benthic communities. So the key takeaways here are that, yeah, the benthic communities are different. The West has significantly more brown macroalgae and the East has significantly more turf algae. Additionally, the percent cover of CCA and encrusting algae is more than double that in the East, what it is in the West. And these three benthic types that I just mentioned are contributing the most to the differences or dissimilarities between Eastern and Western benthic communities. Now, I quickly wanna just look at brown macroalgae and turf algae percent cover, because not only do these two benthic types comprise a large proportion and the majority of the benthic communities at all six of our sites, but they're also the primary benthic types that are targeted by yellowtail parrotfish for foraging. So when we look at the percent cover of brown macroalgae by site, we see that Europa Bay has significantly less brown macroalgae than East Inner and all three of the Western sites. Additionally, both East Inner and East Outer have significantly less brown macroalgae than West Inner. And when we look at turf algae percent cover, it's almost a mirror image of what we just saw. So Europa Bay and East Outer have significantly more turf algae than West Inner. And looking at this by side, we again see that the West is dominated by brown macroalgae and the East is dominated by turf algae. But do these differences equate to differences in the foraging of yellowtail parrotfish? Well, here we can see the proportional composition of our benthic communities at all six of our sites during three different sampling periods. And I specifically chose these sampling periods because they directly coincide with the sampling periods for our fish follows. I know this looks really messy, but what you can see here, right, is that or brown macroalgae comprise a pretty large proportion of the benthic communities at all six of our sites in October, November, and August. But in March and April, the amount of brown macroalgae decreased at all of our sites, 
And consequently, we saw increases in turf algae. So did these seasonal changes to our benthic communities contribute to differences in the foraging of yellowtail parrotfish? Well, when we look at the proportional composition of bites taken by these fish across all six of our sites during these same sampling periods, we see that in October, November, and August, uh, brown macroalgae is comprising a large proportion of the bites taken by these fish. But as we just saw above, in March and April, yellowtail parrotfish decrease the amount of brown macroalgae that they're biting on, and consequently, they're biting more on turf algae. And so from this, it seems as though the foraging ecology of these fish is influenced by seasonal differences in food availability. But what about site-specific differences, right? Because we just went over that the West has more brown macroalgae and the East has more turf algae. Well, when we look at the proportion of bites taken by fish for all of our sampling periods combined, we see that fish foraging in the West are taking significantly more bites on brown macroalgae than those in the East. And those in the East are taking significantly more bites on turf algae than those in the West. So now we know that the foraging preference of these fish seems to be influenced by both seasonal and site-specific differences in food availability. Remember, there's a second component to this, foraging frequency or foraging rates. Now, I will say I did run a, an analysis and there were no significant seasonal differences in the foraging rates of these fish. However, there were some site-specific differences. So if we look at the bite rate of these fish at all six of our sites, we see that fish in the east are foraging slightly more often than those in the west. There's not a ton of significance here. But when we look at this by side, we can see that fish foraging in the east take significantly more bites per minute or forage more frequently than those in the west. And so the key takeaways here are that the foraging of these fish does seem to mirror both site-specific and seasonal differences in food availability. Fish in the West are foraging more on brown macroalgae, and those in the East are foraging more on turf algae. Additionally, the foraging rates of these fish are significantly lower for fish foraging in the West compared to the East, but there are no significant seasonal differences in the foraging rates or foraging frequency of these fish. Okay, now getting into what I think is by far the coolest part of this project because it revealed some really interesting results, the acoustic data. So this is a map of the general migratory pathways that fish take from their inshore foraging areas to their respective FSAs. And this inset graph that you see here is the percentage of fish that were detected at least once at an FSA throughout our sampling period. So again, we see that 55 out of the 60 fish that we tagged were detected at least once at an FSA. But really the most important thing to note here is that all of our tagged fish exhibited 100% site fidelity. So fish that we tagged in Fish Bay and Western Reef Bay only visited the West FSA, and those that we tagged in Eastern Reef Bay and Europa Bay only visited the East FSA. And that's actually really important to note because that was the baseline of this entire project. And now that we know that these spawning populations are unique, it can make for some really interesting and cool comparisons. But before we jump into the data, I wanna quickly remind you all and think back to these ridge to reef connections, right? So if there's more sediment in the West and there's more ground macroalgae and fish are foraging less, then that should in theory impact reproduction. So at the start of this project, I thought that fish would also spawn less in the West because of all of these different factors. So was I right? <laughs> well, sort of. Um, <laughs> so if we look at spawning site visitation frequency by the West and the East FSAs, we can see that fish are visiting the East FSA significantly more often than the West FSA. And so I started looking more into this to try and figure out why this might be. So I decided to plot the detections of all of our fish 
across our entire sampling period. So this is an abacus plot. I know it looks really messy, Amber. I can see it on your face. But this is an abacus plot. And each point on this plot represents a unique day that a fish was detected at that respective FSA. So on the y-axis are all of our tagged fish. On the x-axis are all of the dates of our sampling period. And what you can see here is that across our sampling period, there's some general gaps in the detections of our fish. But what I really want to point out and note is sort of this line at June 27th, 2022. Because before this day, fish are consistently being detected at both the west and the east FSAs. But after this day, fish are still consistently being detected at the east FSA, but they seem to forego spawning completely at the west FSA, as you can see from all of the gaps in the detections of these blue dots here. And at first, when I found this, I thought that maybe the tags were starting to die in the West because we did tag a lot of those fish first. However, I started reading more up on the literature and doing more research, and I remembered that there's actually a second spawning aggregation in the West, a satellite aggregation located just northwest of the primary West FSA, which you can see here represented by the white star. Now, the secondary aggregation was also discovered in the early 1960s, and it was subsequently studied in 2011, 2012, and 2013 by a previous master student. Fish have been observed spawning here on occasion. However, it lies along the migratory pathway to the West FSA. And so this secondary aggregation is thought to act as more of a migratory stopover point for these fish that are traveling from their inshore foraging areas to the West FSA. Because remember, conditions at the West FSA should in theory be more conducive to reproductive success. And so knowing that this aggregation existed, I decided to plot the detections of our fish at the secondary aggregation. And what I found was that, yeah, some of these gaps in the detections were just days when fish weren't really moving around much and weren't really being detected anywhere throughout the array. But other times, when these fish were not being detected at the West FSA, they were still consistently being detected at the secondary aggregation, especially after this June 27th date. And so this is really interesting because it seems as though these fish are preferentially choosing to spawn at the satellite aggregation for almost three months. So I decided to compare the spawning site visitation frequency of the West and the Northwest FSAs. And what I found was that they were almost mirror images of one another. So in April of 2022, spawning site visitation frequency was lowest at the Northwest FSA, but it peaked at the West FSA. In August of 2022, spawning site visitation frequency peaked at the Northwest FSA but was lowest at the West FSA. And then I also decided to look at some environmental variables and compare it with spawning site visitation frequency because the environment has a lot to do and can really contribute and affect how often these fish are spawning. And what I found was that for the Northwest FSA, spawning site visitation frequency was positively correlated with water temperature and negatively correlated with salinity. And at the West FSA, you guessed it, the exact opposite was true. So looking at the spawning site visitation frequency for all three of these FSAs, we see that they're all significantly different from one another. And so the key takeaways here are that spawning site visitation frequency or how often these fish are visiting the spawning sites is significantly higher at the East FSA compared to both the West and the Northwest FSAs. But if we look at it by side and we can combine the spawning site visitation frequency for the Northwest and the West FSA, then fish are visiting the Western FSAs significantly more frequently. And probably the coolest finding, again, is that the spawning patterns at the satellite aggregation seemed to mirror those at the primary one which may indicate that this secondary aggregation is being utilized for spawning and reproduction 
when conditions at the primary FSA or just something isn't optimal or ideal for these fish. And then lastly, looking at spawning site duration, I only compared the two primary FSAs for this. And what I found was that fish do spend significantly more time at the East FSA compared to the West FSA, which may indicate greater reproductive effort or capacity. Okay, so let's recap everything we just went over in the context of my original hypotheses. But instead of me just regurgitating the same information back to you, because I know how boring that can be, I'm gonna test you to see how well you've been paying attention. Because I've been up here talking for 35 minutes, but have you been listening for that long? So we're gonna have a pop quiz. Woo! Don't worry, there's no penalty for any wrong answer, but as an incentive, there will be prizes for anyone who gets an answer correct. So don't be shy, raise your hand and volunteer your answers. And by the way, these are all true and false. So even if you don't know it, you got a 50-50 shot. So. <laughs> okay, question 1.1, true or false? There's a greater amount of sediment in the West. Hey, true. Well. Yes, that is true. Great work. Here you go. It's, it's a seaweed snack. So you can embrace your inner paired fish as you forage on algae. All right. Question 1.2. Terrigenous sediment comprises a larger proportion of sediment in the West. Amber. False. False. That is right. So remember, there's more overall terrigenous sediment or land based sediment in the West because there's more overall sediment but the proportional composition of the sediment is not different between sides. Oh yes. <laughs> All right, question 2.1. There's more brown macroalgae in the West and more turf algae in the East. Tyler. True. <laughs> True. Yes. Great. <laughs> Great work. Okay, question 3.1. Fish in the West have lower foraging rates or forage less frequently than those in the East. Yes, Liz. True. True. <laughs> Great work. <laughs> Enjoy your snack. <laughs> All right. Question 4.1. Fish foraging in the West consume more brown macroalgae and those in the East consume more turf algae. True. Allison. Oh, oh. Well, somebody said it. So they can Sean. <laughs> yes. Great work, Sean. There you go. <laughs> okay. This next one is a trick question because I briefly mentioned it, but I did mention it. True or false? Fish forage less in the winter. False. Tyler. False. false. <laughs> Correct. There were no significant seasonal differences. <laughs> in foraging. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Question 4.3. Diet composition reflects seasonal changes in the benthic composition. Allison. True. True. Yes. Great work, my love. Good job. Okay, there's two questions left. So if you're hungry and you want a seaweed snack, now is your time to answer. Competition. Okay, question 5.1. Fish visit the West FSA less frequently than the East FSA. Come on, somebody. Sean. Uh, true. True, yes, correct. So remember, fish do visit the western spawning site more often but looking at it just by fsa they do visit the east fsa more frequently last question fish spend less time at the west fsa compared to the east fsa you want another snack sean great great work all right thank you to everyone who volunteered your answers I really appreciate it, and I hope you embrace your inner paired fish as you eat your seaweed snacks. Okay, now looking at the bigger picture here and thinking about all of these connections from ridge to reef, right? At the start of this project, I thought that the West would have more sediment 
it would have more brown macroalgae and thus fish would forage less. And what I found was that, yeah, fish did forage less in the West, which just so happened to have more sediment and brown macroalgae. But the methods that I utilized weren't able to definitively test for these direct linkages. And so in this case, correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation, but it's still really interesting and something that future studies should definitely explore more of. Now, again, at the start of this project, I thought that fish would also spawn less in the West because if they're foraging less, they have less reproductive capacity. And to an extent that was true, but the presence of this secondary aggregation, it increased the complexity of this initial study, but it also revealed some really interesting results. Most notably, that this satellite aggregation seemed to become the primary aggregation for over three months. Now, why is this interesting? Well, because this behavior of fish choosing to spawn at a satellite aggregation rather than at a primary one, it has been documented before in Gruber and Hind, but typically when these species choose to spawn at a satellite aggregation, it's due to overpopulation and lack of available habitat at the primary aggregation. And so with nowhere else to go, they choose to spawn at these secondary aggregations. But that doesn't really seem to be the case here because pretty much all of our fish are preferentially or seem to be preferentially spawning at the satellite aggregation and are not being detected at the primary one. And so this is really interesting because this sort of behavior has never been documented before in resident group spawners. Additionally, this research is really important because it adds to the growing body of literature on resident spawning aggregations, because most aggregation research here in the U.S. Virgin Islands is focused on these transient species like groupers and snappers. And also, thinking back about how everything is connected from ridge to reef, this research, I hope, will be utilized to better inform management practices to mitigate some of these land-based impacts to our nearshore marine environments and to better protect some of these ecologically important herbivores that are critical for maintaining coral reef health and resilience. And although this research produced some really interesting and cool results, it's not the end all be all, right? It's really just a stepping stone and a piece of this much larger puzzle. And so as we look to future directions for research, I really think that future studies should, number one, utilize methods to definitively make connections between some of these different variables. Number two, mapping out both broad scale and site specific oceanographic conditions would be really beneficial because this would provide a better idea of how sediment is being deposited and transported across the reef. Nutrient analysis should also be a top priority as this would, would provide an additional metric for linking sediment, benthic, and foraging. Coupling spawning site visitation frequency and duration with other metrics like gonadosomatic index or GSI, I think would provide a much more reliable estimate of overall reproductive capacity. And for those of you who aren't familiar, GSI is just a way to estimate the reproductive capacity of an individual by measuring their gonads. And really this sort of recommendation stems from a paper by Clifton in 1995, where he was studying the reproduction of striped parrotfish in relation to food availability. And what he found was that these fish continue to spawn year round at their aggregations, but the gonadosomatic indices of these fish actually changed in relation to food availability. And so I think coupling GSI with the metrics that we use would provide a much more reliable and comprehensive estimate of this. And then lastly, you know, there's a lot of different things that can affect the timing and the formation of these aggregations. In particular, I want to note too, individual sex and predatory risk. So individual sex is really important because it's more energetically expensive to produce eggs rather than sperm. And so males tend to frequent spawning aggregations more often than females. Now, we actually tried to ID the sex of our tagged fish using a handheld ultrasound, but 
as most research around here, it didn't quite go as well as we had hoped. So future studies should definitely take this into account um, as this can definitely affect how often fish are visiting their spawning sites. And additionally, predation is really important because we have seen predation events occur at our aggregation sites, primarily by barracuda, but we never really took into account predator abundance. And that's definitely something that can affect the timing and the formation of these aggregations. And before I end, I have to acknowledge all of the funding sources and the people that made this very, very, very large project even remotely manageable. So first off, my funding sources, a huge thank you to the VIFs for Rich to Reef Grant, the Lawn Avento Charitable Trust, the Louisiana Pipeliners Association, and the Strong Coast NRT, as well as all of the people who made this project what it was especially my advisor, Dr. Rick Nemeth, and my two committee members, Drs. Edwin Kujavera and Tyler Smith, Sean Cadison for her immense, immense, immense amount of field support, and my two amazing data gurus, Caleb Linko and Sarah Heidman, and everyone who helped out in the field collecting data, <laughs> especially the five people you see here at the bottom, as you can probably imagine, this project required a whole lot of field work, manpower, time, energy, effort, and none of this would have gotten done without their help. And so for them, I'm forever grateful because now I can graduate. <laughs> and with that, you may now call me master. <laughs> Any questions, by the way? <laughs> yes, Tyler. Did you, did you ever see the um, terminal base in your, in your area? And what were they doing? Obviously. I know they weren't going to aggregation. So we have seen a few of them at the aggregation. They just look pissed most of the time. You know? They're just like, they like go up to the other fish and chase them. And they're like, what are you doing? And yeah. Jenna, um, could you please repeat the questions from the audience? Because I cannot hear them very well. Sorry, Edwin. Tyler asks if we've ever seen the terminal phase males in our areas and what were they doing? Oh, okay, thank you. So yeah, we have seen them at the aggregations before and they just look like they're, they're mad and they just chase around the initial phase fish and kind of are like, we don't want you here. I don't know what you guys are doing sort of thing. But we haven't, I haven't really seen them in the foraging habitats. Like very often though. They do go to the spawning sites. They do go to the spawning sites. Yeah, we've seen a couple. You know, I was going to say, um, for when you process the sediment, maybe you could explain a little more for the audience how changing the temperature, the higher temperatures, what, how it changes the sediment, how, okay. what it burns and what's being burned and. Yeah, so Rick just said for the general audience, um, like explaining more of like the different sediment burns and what it actually does. Um, oh. Yeah, so drying the sediment originally, that just gets you a dry weight, right? When you do the first burn at 550 degrees, it burns off all of the organics in the sample or algae. So what you're left with is sediment, the inorganics. And then the 950 degree burn volatizes the carbonates in the sample. What you're left with is the land-based sediment or terrigenous sediment. Now, I had to do a further calculation to account for the, this thing called loss on ignition, which is just the amount of carbonates that is lost. Anyway, it's sort of confusing. But anyway, I made this calculation and that's how you get the final amount of carbonate or marine-based sediment and the final amount of land-based sediment or terrigenous. Sean. Um, I was wondering if you had if you had a good idea or any kind of idea about the relative population sizes of the east versus the west, the FSAs. At the aggregations? Yeah, because um, you mentioned more time was spent at the eastern FSA than the western. Mm -hmm. And I, I know there's um, been some evidence that at least with groupers, the smaller the um, spawning population at an FSA, the longer time they'll spend there. Okay. Uh, so I just wondered if, you, if, you, if there was a, if you thought there was a big difference in the population sizes at each site. Sean was asking if there was a difference in the population sizes at the two different aggregations, because in groupers, 
they tend to spend more time at an aggregation, the smaller size of the population it is. Um, yeah, I don't really know definitively about the population sizes. I mean, we've obviously made observational dives at the aggregations and depending on when you go, there's either no fish spawning at the aggregations or there's like 400 fish. So I've seen a ton of fish at both. We've seen 400 spawning at each, at each one during different times, but I don't know about the actual population size. I mean, I would think that 400 is probably like the upward end of the range, but we've seen that at both sites. So just on two different occasions. Amber. Do you know anything about the like difference in nutritional value for the fish between like brown algae and turf algae? So I would think that you would like if you had a really, really nutrient rich food that you would have to take fewer bites than you would have right. something that you're just kind of snacking on. Right. So Amber asks if we know anything about the nutritional value of the different algae that they're eating on. Um, yeah, originally we were gonna do uh, like a nutrient analysis sort of thing, but it didn't end up happening. Um, but in general, brown macroalgae like Dictyota is chemically defended. And so in theory, that's a lesser quality food than turf algae, right? But yellowtail parrotfish are weird and they preferentially choose to spawn on longer turf algae and Dictyota. Um, so, I mean, in this instance, I would think that turf algae is, has more nutritional quality. Um, we, we did actually, for our fish follows, we had GPSs tracking our movements. And so while we're following the fish, we can actually calculate sort of their foraging range. And that's sort of an, indi an indirect estimate of forage quality, because if they're traveling farther, then they have to look for more food or more higher quality food. So. I briefly went through that data and it seems as though the foraging habitats on the West are lar larger, which would indicate less nutritional quality on the West, but yeah, that's sort of like indirect data right now. Pasha. Um, did you, you did a lot of different fish follows. Did you happen to look at vigilance? Um, so whether they were <laughs> define that. Uh, <laughs> so how much they are trying to like get away from you, how like alert they are, um, yeah. and compare those on the two different sides, because you would think that in a higher area of sedimentation that you're going to have potentially less visibility. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you would anticipate mm -hmm. that you would have higher vigilance right. in those areas or even hypervigilance in those areas. Right. Um, and then could that be contributing to them moving to like the Northwest versus the West, right. um, during that period of time. So Tasha asks if we looked at differences in the vigilance or like how, if these fish are paying attention to us while we were doing our fish follows between West and East. Um, we didn't directly look into that, but we tried to stick with fish and like follow fish that were acting normal. Like typically if a fish acted weird or like did a weird behavior, we'd kind of move away from them for a while and then go back. Um, so yeah, we didn't really directly, I guess, test for like west versus east if they're being weird or not but yeah. um, well you also didn't take observations immediately you kind of follow them for a while till they got used to you right yeah we we typically like i followed them typically for like one or two minutes before i started taking data just so that i knew they were like okay with me yeah um and if a fish took off before the end of the 10 minutes we just excluded it from yeah. the analysis so. we didn't really look at it by stuff okay yes for the non-fish people, can you define what a weird is? <laughs> okay, for the non-fish people, can I define what a weird characteristic is? Okay, so some of them, like if I'm the fish and like I'm following, right, they'll just like kind of like look at you, you know, or they'll like hide under a rock and just kind of like breathe really heavy and stay there. Like the sting is looking at me and I'm kind of scared. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, yellowtail parrotfish are actually like, better than say like cleaning parrotfish. I cannot follow a cleaning parrotfish. They do not like me. For some reason. <laughs> they just like hide under rocks for like 10 minutes until I leave. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, sort of like a weird behavior. They'll either like swim really fast because they're like, I know I can beat you in a foot race or they'll just hide because they're terrified. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. One more fish follow-up question. Yes. Um, so the literature often shows that in the same species, smaller individuals feed at a higher rate than larger individuals. Mm -hmm. the, how are the fish sizes between the different fish follow groups? Yeah, so Rick asked um, how the fish sizes were between the different fish follow groups, because typically smaller individuals forage more frequently than larger individuals. I did test for that, and there were no significant differences in the lengths of the fish that we followed between sides. So, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Any questions? I have one. Oh, from yeah, the chat. Uh, I actually have a question. Yes, Edwin. Um, if you look at the map that you showed us, I'm kind of curious of what uh, what is the ultimate driver of the differences in sedimentation other than other than development. So here's here's what I'm getting at. Where are the guts located in that map if you look at it? Because uh, there's two things that could be going on. It could be that one side has a lot of guts, so you get a lot of sediments being pumped in, and that just happens to be the side that is developed, or each side has guts, and one gut is clean, and the other one isn't. I'm just curious about what the reality is. Because on the side that seems to be less sedimented, you do have two large ponds, which suggests that you get a lot of drainage. Yes. Um... So yeah, there's like a lot of different things that can be contributing to sediment in this area. Um, and you've, what you've probably read in my thesis. Um, so yeah, guts is one of the primary ones. So I don't know if everyone on Zoom can see my mouse, but one of the guts kind of comes out right here. And there's another one on the Western side. Uh, the presentation is not showing anything. It's in the, here. <laughs> Did you go back to the slides? Oh, wait. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Coming. <laughs> Awkward. What's up? <laughs> okay. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay. So if you see my mouse, there's right, like right. one gut that comes out near here, and there's another one on the west somewhere in this general area. And then in Fish Bay, there's a gut that comes out. So yeah, the guts definitely have a lot to do with where sediment's being deposited. And I also noted that some of these different salt ponds and stuff, there was a paper that came out a while back talking about sort of the sediment retention capabilities of the salt ponds. Yep. Fish Bay and Reef Bay, they said that it wasn't very good and it's clearly like, it's at risk for overtopping and stuff like that. And so if you have heavy rainfall, then that can be contributing to sediment in the area. Um, and then the oceanographic conditions too, because if you've ever been out to Reef Bay, I mean, everything pushes in to the west and it sort of flows from the eastern shoreline right here and it gets trapped over here and kind of everything gets pushed into this western side. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely not just land development is contributing to this. There's a lot of other things here, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Questions. Jenna, I have a couple of questions as well. Hi. Hi, so good job. Um, yeah, so uh, one comment and then two questions. So one comment is that you can have um, organic sediment. So your first burn could actually also be including organic sediment. So just a note on that. But um, this the two questions I had actually have to do with this figure. So when you look at a watershed map of this area, it seems like there are different subwatersheds that your different sediment station stations would have been in. So did you look at how the watersheds, like are those actually in different watersheds, subwatersheds? Um, I don't think that they are. The Reef Bay watershed is pretty large and like all of our sediment stuff was from like here and then one right here, one right here, 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 and then Europa Bay. Europa Bay is the only one that's sort of in a different watershed than Reef Bay. Um, I still think if you look at, so I would suggest, I guess this is more of a suggestion then, I would look at the sub watershed. So you you are probably right that the major watershed, they may all still be within that, but there are likely sub watersheds that might actually get at like Edwin's point about um, core, like you might be able to tease that out a little bit more if you look at those, because even just looking at the topography, water is going to flow downhill differently 
in Europa Bay and even on the east, the western, the western side of Reef Bay and the eastern side of Reef Bay. So there's likely some subwatershed stuff that might be interesting for you to look at. Right. Okay. Um, yes. Sorry. I was just going to make a comment that you, you could say that we have all that other sediment data where the traps have been spread across the entire study yeah. site that you're not going to look at, but we have right. that. We could tease that apart yeah. later on. Yeah. Did you maybe yeah. That yeah, we have more sediment data. Um, in addition to doing the matrices, we had sediment cups sort of spread out more so throughout the area. Um, so Rick was just saying we can tease apart that as well and use that. And then my other question is still not surprisingly about sediment. So <laughs> um, this one was about um, how those peaks in the spawning site visitation frequency if you had looked how those might correlate to your monthly sediment data. So you were collecting monthly, you presented, the, I think those are mean annuals, but I wasn't mm -hmm. clear on that. But the yeah. monthly ones, like, do you see, um, it seems like you have an opportunity in your data to be able to look at how those changes in the mean monthly sediment data might relate or correlate with your changes in those, those monthly yeah. site like those peaks did you look at that like maybe the fish are moving because like the water you looked at salinity and temperature but maybe they're moving because it's like the water's gross yeah i did i did look at that um sediment and uh like macroalgae and turf algae cover were part of the environmental variables that i looked at <clears throat> um and that's why at the end i said that like correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation for all of this because that like it didn't show any significant relationship between sediment and their spawning site visitation frequency. But did you look at the monthly sediment data or were you only looking at mean annual sediment? I did the monthly sediment data. Oh, okay. That's interesting then. Thanks. That was it. Of course. Matt. Um, I'm not sure how bad it is in Reef Bay and Fish Bay and New Orleans Bay, but how about if you put gas from, um, which is a macroalgae? Right, like floating in, sargassum? Yeah, both, benthic or um, floating sargassum. How bad is it in these areas? And could they, could it possibly be impacting that side on the west side? Yeah, Matt asked uh, like how the amount of sargassum in these areas is, um, for those of you who don't know, sargasm, it can either be benthic and like attached to the substrate or it can be floating. Floating sargasm is typically bad when it comes inshore. So he's just asking if there were differences. Um, yeah, we see diff like seasonal differences in sargasm, right? It's not like year round. Um, so there's definitely times when it's worse. Um, the West has a lot more benthic sargasm than the East. I don't really think I've seen much benthic sargasm in the east compared to the west. Um, but when these floating sargassum blooms come through, it kind of gets like caught up in Europa Bay because it's just kind of like this little pocket. And then, yeah, we see a lot in the west too. And in Fish Bay, it gets sort of caught up. And the follow-up is that, could that be part of the reason why you're seeing some of the fish going to that other, um, instead of the west FSA going to that? Like the northwest one? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible. I mean, the fish don't really seem to mind it. They actually eat the floating sargasm, so they seem to actually like it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a possibility. Like I said, there's so many like environmental things that could be influencing where they're going and stuff like that. So yeah, it's hard to say definitively, but it's a possibility. All right, if there's uh, no more questions, then... I'm done! <laughs> it's not over yet. It's not over yet, Jenna. It's not over yet. <laughs>